and we lead off the microphone. <laughs> What's yes. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hannah Glover, a PhD student in social policy at the University of Edinburgh. And today I'm delighted to welcome you all to Steve Goldred's um, Sociology Speaker Series event, um, co organised with the Centre for Research on Families and Relationships. Today, Steve will discuss his recent research results through a talk titled Young People Making a Life in the New Era of Fintech. But first, I'd like to introduce him a little bit to you all. Steve first left school in the 90s to begin an electrical apprenticeship, then, in his own words, had about 27 jobs, <laughs> so he's no stranger to the casualised and precarious labour market that young people navigate today. He even had a stint of playing cricket in the UK. In 1999, he decided to return to university in search of a better job, perhaps in music or sports journalism, but instead he became enamoured by social theory, majored in politics, and eventually in 2009 completed his PhD in youth sociology. Steve is now globally recognised for his work in youth sociology and is an associate professor, professor in sociology and the director of the Newcastle Youth Study Centre at the University of Newcastle, Australia. He's also an associate editor of the Journal of Youth Studies and on the editorial board of the Sociological Review, DIY Alternative Cultures and Society, and Journal of Applied Youth Studies. While the media today espouses views that young people are lazy, irresponsible, or narcissistic, he assures us that today's young people are all right. He works directly with them in his research to find how social class affects their opportunities, attitudes, and cultural activities. His research monograph, Youth, Class and Everyday Struggles, won the 2020 Raven Connell Prize for the best first book in Australian sociology. It uses a Bourdoisian lens to explore two case studies, the media's imp implicit class use of the terms hipster and bogan, and the post-school transitions of DIY punks and creatives who choose to live a life of voluntary poverty for the sake of artistic passions and ethical concerns, all while navigating the insecurity that this situation creates. I find research in these non-traditional youth pathways personally very interesting, and this is an important contribution to destigmatizing less privileged young people and learning how we can better support their flourishing, something that I hope my PhD research on post-school transitions in Scotland can achieve too. His latest book, Bordeaux, Bordeaux and Effect, moves Bordeaux's theory and concepts away from the theoretical to more applied spaces or towards a theory of practice. He also hosts a fascinating website called Youth Class Culture, where he shares his latest outputs and hosts a directory of wealth and hosts a directory of a wealth of resources on sociology and youth studies. Steve's current research, which we'll hear more about today, concerns the impact of fintech or financial technology on young people as they navigate their transitions to adulthood. With that, I'd like to welcome Steve to speak. Thank you for joining us and take it away. Thanks so much for that um, lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm not sure where you dug up some of that information from, but um, um, that was really good. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to be this in great town and great university today. And um, as you all know, it's a really great pre uh, pleasure to have like 40 minutes to talk instead of like 10 or 15 that we normally do. So um, with that, I decided to go kind of wide rather than deep. Um, so please don't hold that against me. I'm not always lacking so much like depth, I suppose, but I wanted, I suppose, to um, almost do some PR for all the research we've been doing in our center over the past few years on the FinTech stuff. So I'm kind of going to talk about stuff across a, a bunch of different um, uh, research projects over the years um, that we're building towards hopefully a, a very big project in the near future, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I, I should say too that like while I'm presenting by myself today, um, the work um, with the people in the centre is very much part of all these projects and publications. Uh, in particular, Julia Coffey and Julia Cook, who I work so closely with on all the projects, and with Dave Ferruja, who unfortunately went back to Melbourne recently from Newcastle, and all the other crew there um, are, are very much um, contributions to what I'm talking about today, con contributors to today. So yeah, we've, um, we started this about four years ago, where we... I don't really know how it happened, but our college had leftover research money. It sounds like a fantasy, but it's true. They had like, like almost a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So they decided to fund four seventy thousand dollars programs. So it must be a bit more than that. And we were lucky enough to get one. Uh, and one of the things we really wanted to do was talk to young people, disadvantaged young people about their use of debt. And particularly at, thought, at first, we thought we were going to be talking about payday loans and things like that. 
But very quickly when we started doing the research, we realised that those things weren't being used that much. Buy now, pay later products were particularly being used to cover everyday expenses in all kinds of different ways. So we kind of shifted our focus towards that. That then shifted the focus more widely about fintech and financial practices generally. Um, so we've done all these kind of projects. I won't go into them one by one, many different methods. Please ask me about those if you're interested. One in particular, the betting with mates one. So when we started recruiting for all these projects, no men would come forward, young men would come forward to talk about us. We even in, in, um, got a recruitment company to try and do that for us and they struggled as well. So um, I'm very interested in sport and I'm involved in local sports. So I kind of invented this little project as a kind of Trojan horse in a way to kind of recruit men to talk about their financial practices by doing a thing on gambling. And then we could also ask them about their financial practices in that as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. We've done a bunch of interview stuff. We did use some creative methods, um, but um, my colleagues did a walking ethnography of a, of a um, shopping center to see how these things are advertised. Won't surprise you that in the kind of high-end ones, their little, little thing on the counter, low-end shops, you know, big signs, all that kind of stuff. That how this, I'm sure you can imagine how it works. The current one we're doing is a really interesting project about the rise of Finfluencers. Um, uh, TikTok and Instagram in particular, often young, attractive people giving out information about financial advice, often with no qualifications. Uh, we're very interested in how young people and everyone really gets their financial information. I would say overall, one of the things I want to say about financial practices is we're kind of against the idea of financial literacy. Um, particularly the way it's taught to young people as maths and like making responsible choices. Um, one of the surveys we did, the, the survey we did had this ridiculous stat in it that was like, you know, 39% uh, of these 574 people each week are missing meals because they can't afford it. And this is in a relatively like wealthy place like Newcastle. So um, I think, you know, things like that in, the, in terms of the huge cost of living pressures that are constantly rising uh, make the idea of literacy and capability, I think, a little bit sus. Make it a little bit about rationality and choice, which they don't really have. And we certainly know from our research that finances are emotional. Um, and what we actually see in most of our research is young people are making pretty sensible, reasonable decisions about how to get by in life. We do have some horror stories, but for the most part, you know, they're just kind of stitching together a life the best they can, often by using these things quite sensibly. You'll give me a yell when I'm like going on too long, won't you? Yeah, good. Right. Um, so this is the kind of, again, I go into the conceptual background, but these are things that are kind of the basis of our work, or at least I should say the way that I'm analyzing this stuff. My team, our team members kind of do a little bit different things as well. Um, but, you know, the digitalization, financialization of everyday life, I'm particularly interested in. Consumption as a form of credit, not just as a gateway to buy stuff, but you know, kind of got to, you know, choose your consumption um, uh, products to reflect yourself more and more as well. Um, I'm particularly very interested recently in the kind of combination of rentier capitalism and ordinal society. Um, the Ordinal Society is a wonderful book by Marion Forcade and Kieran Healy. I really think that's gonna be an influential um, thing in this um, area over the next few years. And rentier capitalism, the way that kind of capitalism is increasingly based on um, extracting rents rather than selling as stuff. Particularly the way that like services and um, things like that are being kind of foreclosed um, you know, Uber's got Uber drivers got to pay six quid now to like pick you up from the airport. It's like all these ways that's kind of different um, companies are kind of taking a snip out of everyday life just because they can. Um, in Australia, we have this wonderful work about the new class around the asset economy, the way that whether you own your home or not is actually as much of, if not more, a key understanding of class systems today than your job or your kind of broader capital um, investments. You know, the quip about that is essentially a house in Sydney goes up about 70 grand a year, which is more than the average wage, right? So um, it kind of has real implications on what wealth means and access to actually having housing, particularly because our superannuation system and retirement system is very much based on owning your own home. I'll talk a little bit about CM Nagai's work um, that has been very influentially on, influential on me recently, uh, stuff about ugly feelings, aesthetic categories and gimmicks. And this is kind of stuff that I'm developing myself. Um, if I have time, I'll get to the Borgia for the works for the bank stuff. I'm not sure I will, um, but like um, I'm particularly interested in the notions of subjectivities at the moment. And there's a lot of work around how young people are kind of, uh, everyone really is encouraged to be a speculative kind of subjectivity, um, taking risk and investing in yourself for the future, kind of development of like the 90s kind of Foucauldian entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial self. 
I think that works really valuable. But um, in our research, I can starting to see a little bit of difference, I think, with young people's idea of whether they're investing in the future or whether they're really kind of gambling about the future. I think there's kind of two distinct things going on there. It's probably real class distinctions between who gets to invest and who gets to gamble. So firstly, I should say what the hell is FinTech because not everyone is familiar with it. I've learned while um, giving these talks over the past few months. So these are three versions that I use. There's gambling where I'll put five bucks on first try score in a rugby league game every now and then and see if I can win a hundred bucks. Um, you can see current um, thing there is zero. I've lost about $270 over the past three years while having this. One time though, me and some mates won 1200 bucks in a group thing and we went and bought some tickets to go to the footy. So there's good news stories there as well. This is crypto. Uh, when um, I, I, I'm not a crypto person, I'm definitely not a crypto bro. But um, when um, crypto became a real thing and the Sam Bankman fried thing was going on and people were getting prosecuted and the whole thing was coming down, I was kind of interested to see what it looks like. So I whacked 50 bucks into this account, bought some crypto. I bought a real dodgy one, which I got rid of in these two. Notice put in 50 bucks, now there's 16 left. Probably a very good indication of most mainstream people's um, engagement with crypto. This one is a different story. This is called Raise, R-A-I-Z. What this one does, so it's currently got five grand in it. I've put in 4,279 and it's made approximately 900. The way this works is every time I tap my card, just say I pay $3.50 for something, it rounds up or down to the nearest dollar and puts 50 cents into that um, account and then invests into the share market. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of example on, on it that's working for me at the moment. Um, but you can see a bit like as these things kind of um, become more popular and more prominent, I think, you know, we can kind of see how the everyday life is being financialized in this sense. There's more opportunities to kind of do this kind of stuff for everyone now. Finance has been somewhat democratized, but I would say it means actually more opportunity to exploit more people um, because of that. This one's called Remitly. Um, I noticed this when I was watching the recent cricket T20 World Cup, or was it a, uh, the one day World Cup, whatever it was. Um, it was heavily advertised on our pay TV towards um, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian and Sri Lankan families. And essentially what this is, is an app for uh, migrant workers who say move from Bangladesh to go to um, Dubai to build skyscrapers or go to Hong Kong to, to work as maids or whatever, to send remittances back to their families. You know, something that we know in sociology is a real thing in terms of global mobility. So my point here is, is basically anything you can think of just about, and particularly negative kind of exploitive things, some tech bro asshole somewhere is trying to build an uh, um, app to kind of exploit it in one way or another. So it's a, a very, a real thing. So moving a little bit towards thinking about well, what some of our research findings are. Throughout our different projects, we've, we, we can see that there's very much a moral, moral economy of debt. Debt is essentially ubiquitous for young people. Um, they're all in debt in one way or another. I would say debt is probably ubiquitous for most of us. Um, uh, you know, things like mortgages and stuff like that even kind of seen as good kinds of debt. Um, and the young people kind of sketch out when we talk to them about what's good and bad debt, um, a very clear hierarchy. Good debt is very much things about investing in the, in the self. So things like higher education debt is seen as a good form of debt. It's an investment. Mortgages are seen as like an upwardly mobile form of debt, something I can aspire to in the future if I'm lucky to be able to save, you know, probably 150 grand at the moment in Australia to be able to get a deposit for a house. Um, so that's, that's another kind of upwardly mobile debt. But most debts are kind of a little bit more ambivalent, if not pernicious. So car loans, for instance, like in Newcastle, the public transport's diabolically bad. If you need to get around in Newcastle, you need a car. Car loans are seen as kind of good in some ways that they open up some freedom, bad in other ways because cars rapidly depreciate and you lose money. Um, everyday forms of debt like buy now, pay later and stuff like that are bad, irresponsible debts to be avoided, despite all the young people we talk to kind of having those debts as well. There's this in interesting juxtaposition of the moral judgment of them and also the kind of widespread use of them. And I'll get to that in a sec. So I would also say that, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in some depth, that our young people throughout the last four years seem to be increasingly dubious about the good debts. Um, in the middle of this period, our, uh, our government basically doubled the hex debts, You know, made the arts degree 20 grand into 70 grand's worth of debt. 
um, you know, this obviously has real implications for young people's future. Um, so we have very much people that get into trouble with money and debt see it as being imperiling their future. We have some kind of quotes for young people that say, you know, my, I feel like I'm, my life's on hold because, um, you know, I have this debt that I can't pay off. So one of, one of the things we did was run these kind of body mapping workshops. Um, there's a real interesting thing that happens in these. Young people replicate the moral panic stereotypes about them, even though when we ask them about those things directly in interviews, they hate them and think they're massively inaccurate. So there's an interesting thing that goes on in this stuff. I mean, older people denigrating younger people seems to be like a universal. It just seems to happen all the time. You know, Socrates was doing it. Um, I had a PhD, a seven-year-old PhD student a couple of years ago that worked with young people his whole life was interested in this. He interviewed 60-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 15-year-olds, and the 15-year-olds were kind of ragging on six-year-olds for having iPads, right? <laughs> so there's this kind of thing that seems to kind of almost be this natural kind of people below you suck or something. I don't really, I know, as a youth sociologist, I still don't really understand it. But um, <clears throat> young people tend to be critical of their own representation, but like, they also seem to be using it. So when we ask them to kind of tell a story about um, someone with afterpay debt, it was quite something. It's kind of spiralled out of control. They like she started off making sensible decisions, but then it got worse and worse and more dramatic. And you know, she's they, they're killing her. She's so stressed out. They put stress markers under her eyes. She ends up looking like a zombie. Um, so they they were replicating these kind of deeply moral discourses about them, um, even though. Um, they kind of disagreed with them when we asked them about their individuals. So this, again, I'm not sure what to do with that. It's kind of a common thing I think that happens in interviews in many ways, but um, it's an interesting thing that was happening all the time. Um, to talk about what debt means and how it feels, I've been, uh, I've got a paper out called In Debt Pending, and this is an ugly feeling that I developed, um, very much influenced by CM Nagai's work, a kind of feminist literary theorist that I, I, I find particularly um, inspiring. Um, and her work kind of talks about anxiety and insecurity, and she she made up some feelings as well. One called something like stuplimity, which is the kind of feeling of being online, both kind of um, excited and kind of feeling dead at once, like um, how that kind of endless doom, doom scrolling works. Um, so I, I, I've talked about being in debt for young people. There's this kind of notion of in-debt pending that brings together the feelings of in debt, um, engagements with the notion of being independent because debt is a way of actually getting some independence from your parents, but also then means you're dependent on them and others in other ways as well. And the way all this kind of correlates to a pending notion of the future. Um, the future and debt are very much um, entwined and certainly in the speculative subjectivity stuff, um, that's very important. So if you're interested in um, kind of thinking, that kind of thinking, please check that out. The other aspect of being influenced by the guy, oops, what's happening? I think we'll see you let someone in here. Oh, no, yep. Um, the feelings of that and the feelings of the apps themselves are very much a gamified space. So again, I've been influenced here by CM Nagai's work who write, writes about gimmicks. Um, the gimmicks are kind of one of the key um, mechanisms of, of late capitalism to kind of engage us with various things. Um, and you can see here that like our young people talk about these apps um, in various ways that are just like talking about other forms of social media or different platforms. The Buy Now Play Later apps in particular are very deliberately enroll aspects of other forms of social media into their spaces. So the feeling rules of them are kind of comfortable for young people. It's just like being online as they always are. So we have uh, one respondent here talking about how Instagram, uh, uh, Afterpay, which is the Australian version of Klarna, I suppose, is um, like the Instagram of banks. It's come along to oppose Facebook. Everything that banks are not, this is it. Now, the irony there, obviously, is kind of Facebook bought Instagram and there are very similar things going on now between banks and Buy Now, Pay Later. Um, they're incorporating them and, and um, inventing their own. Um, here's the kind of the way that it feels and the different things it does. Like, there's a reminder each week about the pay or how much you can spend, um, the payments you made on time, your favourite stores, does this thing at the end of the year where it sends you this kind of this thing like Spotify rap, you know, Spotify sends you all the songs you've listened to, your top five. It sends you this thing at the end of the year, like you bought these amount of shoes and this, and you know, why don't you do it again? Um, all this, and, but you can see that they're kind of wary of this. They're reflexive of it. A, gimm a gimmick is something that you know you're being tricked by, but you kind of participate in it anyway. And it kind of sets up this kind of 
ambivalent wariness of the whole situation. So they know that they're doing that to remind you of buying more stuff. The other thing is terms of here, like how that no longer feels like money uh, being on these things. It feels like the money doesn't actually exist. And that's very deliberate in the way these things work. And we'll talk about some more aspects of that in a sec. So in terms of wider understandings of the young people's lives here, youth studies, I think, has done a great job over the years of thinking about the kind of normativity that young people are encouraged to embrace, you know, meritocracies, this entrepreneurial self where if you kind of invest in yourself and make all the right choices, everything will work out. And there's a lot of great stuff in your studies that kind of points out how young people don't believe that and have to kind of struggle along anyway. Uh, Peter Kelly's work's been particularly um, influential there. I've written stuff about the figures of youth and the way these are um, kind of in, in, interpolated, I suppose, into kind of different discourses as well. And the concept of hope has been particularly important. More recently, you know, uh, more negative work around the slow cancellation of the future, Mark Fisher and, and, um, and Barati and people like that have uh, come into the field to kind of think about how young people are oriented to the future. I've been interested more recently in this kind of idea of speculation, and I suppose it kind of makes sense in terms of the financial work that we're doing, but it's a more broad than that as well. And I think speculation works better than entrepreneurship today. Entrepreneurship seems to resonate more with kind of the risk society um, discourses that were kind of very dominant in our field back then. And like speculation seems to work much better today in a digitalized and financial thing. So um, moving on a bit, I won't go through, I won't spend too much time going through the different conceptual stuff here, but like um, Mark Andreevic and Lisa Atkins work has been particularly influential on me here for Kate and Healy. The way that like um, speculation is both a mode of accumulation centered on finance and money and as a specific mode of social organization turning their own passion into an object of financial investment and thus speculation. I'll show you some examples of these in a sec. I particularly like this, the way the kind of futures, securities and bonds turns once repurposed for the market speculators lexicon, um, return to our everyday social and political vernacular to imbue it with finance's own ambition. So as I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I think this work is really useful for understanding, you know, contemporary late capital subjectivity for want of a better way to put it. Um, so there's definitely, our, our, I've started to look back at some of our data and I we've published a bunch of papers and, you know, sometimes you've kind of done that conceptual work, but then you kind of think, oh, maybe we've kind of need to do something else with that. And um, looking back at some of the data quotes now that are maybe I've interpreted in one way, I've kind of started to see through a different light. So. You know, the moral economy that we're talking about there, I think maybe as much a kind of speculative orientation. So it's to take on a good debt a version of investment, but it's to take on a bad one, a gamble. I mean, there's lots of really interesting research for poor people that take on debts and like completely don't give a shit if they're going to pay them back because they're like, I've got nothing. What are they going to take off me? There's a kind of certain power in that, but there's also a certain kind of gamble going on in terms of the implications um, of what that will mean for you in the future, particularly if you kind of, you know, break the law or uh, further uh, make your, your your ratings bad. So I'll unpack that a little bit more with the with the, um, some examples. There's, there's often a link between gamification and gambling. And I think um, in particular, the way that things like Afterpay and Klarna have limits that really look like targets. Um, you can, if you can think here, anyone that plays games, you know, you have a sort of heads up display sometime and sees how much power you have and it goes up and down. To me, that reminds me a little bit of this. If you, if you pay off your debts well in these things, they reward you with more opportunity to go into more debt. Your limit goes from 1,000 to 1,500 and then to 2,000. Um, and, our, and our respondents are really sus on this, even though they kind of firstly have no real power over it, but like sometimes don't even want it. So they sent me an email notification. You've been a member of ZipPay for whatever, for a year. You can now increase your spending. So, you know, I had a thousand on the anniversary. You've been a member for a year and they were like, you can now have 1500. And I didn't get the option of yes or no. They just increased. Shop component of the app is, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, it's really straightforward. Top of the screen, 2000 available to spend in any store. It's just so big and bold and on the screen. To me, these things sounds like a challenge rather than a limit. So. Um, you know, there's a kind of, again, a sense of the gamification and like um, speculation involved in that. 
They also kind of talk about how when the debts come, you know, you have to pay them, the feeling rapidly changes, um, feeling on the precipice. And I'm reminded here, I don't know if, if, if I'm showing my age here, the end of Caddyshack, where, <laughs> where the ball's close to the hole and there's explosions and you're wondering whether it's going to go, the ball's going to go in or not. It's like they're kind of feeling, they're not sure what's going to happen here. Um, you know, my first payment is actually going to come out after two weeks now. I've been rewarded paying everything off. It's not an issue now, but it's going to be an issue in two weeks' time. It's a real uncertainty here and the kind of feeling of kind of almost gambling with your well-being in a couple of weeks. It's now coming to a crux. It's pretty frightening. So debt has a real influence on temporality here in the way that anxiety is brought forward and back and forth between time and space. We did a small project with creative industry students, um, which, which we called entrepreneur, entrepreneurial debt, where we were um, asking them how they were using forms of debt to set up their creative kind of practices and their creative careers. There were some students that just starting, students just finishing, and we had a, some students that were just out of university starting their careers. Uh, and in this, we used this sandboxing method, um, which was um, carried out by my former PhD student Adriana Harrow who used that in her work and then we imported that method into into this and we got her to do that research for us where you basically have a sand box and a bunch of figurines and you get um, the um, the participant to tell a story um, about the thing you wanted to talk about and here we were getting to talk about their their career pro, um, trajectory and their financial situations so this is Sam and you can see here it's a little bit hard to see but he's drawn out three different pathways He's used these different figures to tell a story, but um, you know the future he's been represented here is unknown. You can see some options, but he's not sure what they are. It's all very alien to him. And there's a speculation about the future that's hard to know whether the investments are gonna pay off. <clears throat> the other thing in that study, in terms of very much a relation to the rentier capitalism that I was talking about earlier on, is the the way that creativity and study has been financialized. Um, many of our uh, stu student participants were like completely surprised how expensive it is to kind of maintain their creative practices through the um, ever, ever more need to have subscriptions to stuff. Um, there's a lot of ongoing costs, programs, monthly payments, um, and that kind of harms your career wise when you're trying to build it up. Now, what's interesting about this, it wasn't just a kind of suck it up and having to pay. The students were kind of um, collaborating together in ways that were resisting some of these problems by, you know, one of them will get one kind of um, subscription, another one would get another one and they would share those things. If they were a group of filmmakers, you know, one would buy the tripod or the camera or whatever and others would buy other pieces of equipment and they'd work as a team and lend it to each other as best they can. Um, they'd take stuff out of the university sometimes without permission and bring it back um, next week. All the kind of stuff that young people do to to kind of get around these things. But again, you can see that there's more and more snips being taken out financially from different aspects of, of our lives through, by these things. This is a really important one for me. Um, and particularly, I don't know if the system's the same here, but in Australia, our HEC system was largely seen as a way of kind of widening participation in a way, you know, you can kind of come in, pay the debt off if you earn enough money in the future. The debts have now been massively raised pretty much doubled in humanities and social sciences, a cynical exercise by a, a right-wing government essentially trying to allow only rich kids to be able to do those things. Um, but we also know that price point isn't really a thing that like students choose their degrees on. So it hasn't really worked. And what we now have is a bunch of often fairly disadvantaged students with massive debts. Um, so there's increasing suspicion, I think, in whether these investments, these good investments at the starts of our projects are actually going to pay off. So here we're talking about, um, we kind of theorise some of the creative industry things around the, pro the concept of the projectariat, where young people kind of working in the creative industries get on a project, maybe get paid, wait months to get another one. They often spend months trying to get paid by the previous thing that they've done. Um, payment becomes very episodic and hard to chase up and um, um, difficult for them to kind of plan and do anything. So um, here we have this respondent talking about that. Things are really good during a project. But afterwards, when it's like, oh, am I getting more work? Companies often kind of keep the, the former worker kind of tagged along by promising something's coming in the future, stick around and something will come. Often never does. So it's a case of waiting. It's been two months since I heard anything from them. It's really hard as well because, you know, she's studying and all that's debt, right? It's kind of, is it worth it? 
Um, this this respondent here, hex is meant to be an investment, but it depends. But it depends. I haven't seen too many dividends from it. What they say in the end there, I think, is really interesting for us in higher education. There should be maybe big price points on the um, student guides to tell them exactly how much they're paying for their degrees, which is often relatively hidden. The other thing that young people are doing is kind of financializing or monetizing their own hobbies and creativity themselves, um, turning their kind of cultural capital sometimes into often quite measly amounts of economic capital, but somewhat helpful for them to maybe, you know, go and have a night out or a takeaway meal or something. So we have a guy here telling you that he makes some leatherwork stuff sometimes. I made a bunch of shit and every now and now people would like that. And it's like 40 bucks, he sells things. Um, we have a, a female participant here that makes jewelry, but also makes Canva templates and has a little side hustle going on there. Um, the side hustle has become a real thing. Universities are now teaching courses on side hustles. I don't know if there's one here or not. Um, the creative industry um, degrees often have these things embedded in them now. They're teaching them to kind of do this stuff, which I find a little bit depressing. It's kind of an ad ad admission really that the industry <laughs> can't support you. Um, financially. The other, another project we did was, as I mentioned already, the bet with mates thing. Um, and again, this is financializing friendship. So obviously gambling is a huge thing. It's so embedded in Australian sport now. That's like very annoying. There's a debate going on at the moment about whether ads should be banned or not. And the government's very unlikely to do that because they're kind of, I suppose, addicted to the tax money that comes out of it. Um, but the little project we did was out, out of my cricket club. Um, where I recruited a bunch of under 25s to talk to us about their practices. Now, the reason I was interested in this is I played cricket my whole life. I see young men coming into these teams, like looking around at everyone doing this kind of gambling stuff and wanting to get involved. Um, it's, it's, it's quite problematic and it's become completely normalized in sport, regardless of the sport, cricket, soccer, uh, rugby league in particular have, have these kind of cultures going on. It's completely normalized. And so you can see here, like, for instance, in COVID, what these guys did was basically replicate the pub in their garages where they would have their computer screens on. They would open up Zoom. They would put 50 bucks each into the shared account. They would have a beer and socialize uh, while doing that. That was often like a thing that first got them into um, having these accounts. We go and have a bet. So it's kind of nice socialization going on there, but it's like, it seems like men can't really have a chat without drinking and gambling, right? So there's like a way, to, a way of lubricating those relations. Um, David here talks about normalizing it. I'm a recruit club, boys, everyone's betting on the horses. I mean, seriously, some teams they're betting on stuff while they're waiting to go out and bat to bat. Like, so gambling's become um, so central to these things. A in really interesting finding in this small study is that all the men think they're good with money. None of them are saving any money. Um, all of them had a story where they lost way too much money and felt bad and guilty and kind of say they'll never do that again. Many had really interesting stories though about how if you're betting with your mates, you tend to be more responsible than when you buy yourself. There's some kind of social uh, discipline thing that goes on between them that you can't really kind of, you know, what they would say, be a dickhead um, with your money if you're using um, stuff with other, it's not all, you know, you're sharing the money. So if you all put a hundred bucks in and, you lose a hundred of it, like it looks bad. So there's a more kind of regulatory discipline going on when they do it together. So um, again, we're reckoning with that at the moment and writing up uh, what we're going to do with that information. And I'm time. Good. Yep. Okay. So I'm starting, starting to kind of analyze this kind of stuff. And um, I've, I've written about aspects of like uh, Andy Furlong called it the epistemological fallacy where um, young people are kind of born into a world where they're told that you know, you make the right choices as a meritocracy, everything will work out if you do the right things and you're smart and you're talented and you work hard. Um, but really after a while they realize that's not so much the case and there's a real disjuncture between what they're sold and what they know and how they how they then have to struggle to, in that transition from being a child to adult, you know, juggling those kind of concerns. So for me, there's an increasing like cynical ambivalent attitude to, this, to the future and to this trajectory uh, coming out in some of our interview quotes. There's definitely this kind of whatever, I'll just take it on, you know, fuck it, we'll see what happens kind of stuff. And we have quotes exactly them saying that. And this to me seems to see feel like the choices that they're making about the future feels a little bit more in the kind of realm of gambling than investing. Um, and I'm not 100% sure, sure what that means yet, but it 
you know, it seems entirely reasonable to me. Um, again, against the the stupid stereotypes about young people being narcissistic and selfish and short term thinking and all that kind of stuff. It's just not the case in our data. They're, they're making long term plans, but the long term seems impossible. So both gambling and investing are forms of speculation. But I think, you know, as the Borgesian sociologist, I would say that there needs to be some kind of distinctions in those kind of generalized notions of, spec of subjectivity. Um, it seems to me that the privilege are probably investing, but the rest are left to gamble. So I'm kind of, I haven't written this up yet, but I'll be kind of writing this up around this idea of distinctions of risk position. Maybe, you know, the privilege can be entrepreneurial speculators and the rest are hopeful, gamble, hopeful gamblers. <clears throat> so um, I, I know that some people in the room are interested in kind of the more youth work aspect of this, I think. Um, and we've done some interviews with youth, youth workers about how they um, engage with young people and their financial issues. I mean, if you're working in youth work, I know post-release or homelessness or drug rehabilitation, those young people are going to tend to have financial problems. That problem kind of cuts across different young, problems in young people's lives. But youth workers tend not to be trained to talk about finances. What, what they are doing is often given financial advice about their own experiences, and they're often terrible at finances as well. Um, and they, or they just tell them stuff like, why aren't you saving money and all that kind of, kind of stuff that's not that helpful. So again, if you're interested in that, that aspect, we've got a paper out on this where we interviewed a bunch of different um, youth workers about what they're doing. And all of them say they're under resource. All of them say they need training. All of them say they would like some um, stuff to use to talk to young people about this. We've got a bunch of ideas about that and we want to make some things to be able to do that, but we just can't get any funding for it. So um, every time we apply for something, everyone says, oh, this is a great idea, but it's not quite what we want to fund. So hopefully we'll be able to kind of do that in the future. Because the other thing that happens, at, say, at a particular youth work centre or company is if you do train someone up in financial advice or whatever, the sector's so precarious that they're likely to go somewhere else, like in the next week anyway, and then you've got to do it again. So it never really works if it's just about training the individual. They need a set of resources to be able to do this. Okay. Let me go off the top. So okay. <laughs> well, I'll very, very quickly get through this last bit. We're, so I'm, I'm mostly in, interested in um, young people's lives and their practices and their everyday emotions and how they're kind of dealing with the future. But obviously this work now that's kind of involved in uh, move towards fintech, I've been increasingly interested in um, different aspects of technologies, apps and, and stuff like that. And I've been working uh, closely recently with Roger Burrows and Bev Skeggs, um, where we're putting together a big project uh, that brings both our expertise together, stuff about young people's practices, um, Roger and Bev and uh, Bev's, um, shall we say, data scientist, probably... I'm being recorded, aren't I? I won't, yeah. Uh, well, I won't call him a hacker. And um, and then we, we want to bring their research together and then kind of run some workshops with young people to kind of talk to them about their knowledge of how AI and data gathering works and then maybe come up with some educational um, stuff about it as well. So that's broadly what we want to do. Um, and I've particularly been in the over the years interested in music and I've done some research in punk scenes and stuff like that. And I've been interested about how like things like punk exist as data, you know, like it's difficult to be alternative if you're on Spotify, you're contributing to the data, right? It's, it's not, but you know, so there's different um, ways of dealing with that. But what we know, and particularly Roger Burrows and colleagues work around the predictive postcode and various other ways of uh, looking at this kind of stuff, is that all our data now has been packaged up by companies, um, companies like Experian in particular, and used and sold to other companies in ways that often don't make a lot of sense, but in ways that judge us, categorize us and exclude us. Um, their work in the UK, in, in England in particular, around rental um, applications now increasingly being decided by um, the different kind of AI machines, um, often show that the data that they're using doesn't really match anything that they're kind of judging on, but they still use it anyway. So it's conceivable now that your music taste has been packaged up in these things and actually being decided whether you get a house or a mortgage or insurance. In the US in particular, in the education system, uh, it's being used a lot. I mean, I think what happens with our knowledge of data and the way it's used is people like us don't care about it too much because we think we're going to be fine. We kind of think that it's only really a problem for people in welfare or coming out of prison and we don't really worry about it. We'll just kind of tick the box and get on with it anyway. But the 
The discipline and regulation is moving up the class system. In the US at the moment, teachers are being sacked basically when they're being judged on whether their um, students are meeting particular scores, regardless of the situational context. The principal can love the teacher, the parents can love the teacher, but if they don't meet this score, computer says no and they're sacked. They're just instantly sacked. Um, these kind of mechanisms are coming in more and more professional areas. Um, you know, maybe a ref score might be more uh, important in the future than it is now, who knows. So these financialization processes are in lockstep with datafication. It's very much, I think it's actually very hard to separate those two things. Um, but importantly, for instance, for our buy now, pay later work, we've been arguing that they need to be more regulated. Um, they're basically cowboys. They can do whatever they want. You can have seven of them. You don't need to like say you have a certain amount of money to get one. So we see, we need, we think there needs to be more regulation there. But what's likely to happen if there is, it'll be just done automatically through AI and data thing, which will exclude people that like uh, poor, that are um, people of color, that are geographically. If you're a, you know, an indigenous kid in Alice Springs in Australia, you just won't have access to them if, where if we allow AI to decide who's getting them, because we know the data in these things just constantly discriminate based on the, the crappy racist data that's fed into them. So I think these are kind of real issues. I'm, I'm writing something up at the moment as a paper, generally maybe going to be called this. It's a nice provocative title, I know, but it's going to be like a, a kind of challenge, I think, to cultural sociology. We have great Borgesian understandings of taste and power and how cultural capital works and all this kind of stuff. But if something like your cultural capital, cultural taste has been dragged in across lines into these machines and used in ways that you don't really know or understand, and even the experts don't really know or understand them either. Um, we, I think we have to think a little bit differently conceptually about what's going on here. Yeah, and I, I, I won't go through it, but this is, a, this is a Silicon Valley insider basically saying that most of the predictive, analysis, predictive anal analytics are uh, Dangerously close to alchemy. No one really knows what they mean, but the companies don't care as long as there's profit, right? So, um, yeah, overfitted models are used in ways that would embarrass any well-trained analyst. But, you know, they're just black boxes used on us. We don't really get any say about them. So the work around ordinal society there and um, um, and name Kate Crawford's work around seeing without knowing, I think, is um, particularly interesting there if you're interested in that stuff. They take a bastardised version of homophily to the nth degree, um, you know, creating kind of downright violently discriminatory levels of kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, I think. So this is what that, this is what we look like when our data is gathered. There's no Stephen Threadgold data in this. What happens is we're kind of packaged up and put into one of these categories, which are essentially risk categories, right? Um, you can see that people working in the data science realm in, in uh, private sphere are not too worried about what they call people. They don't care if the uh, things are symbolically violent or, or embarrassing, right? What I found interesting this when I was first delving into it is like when you recognize yourself in them, it's kind of haunting. It feels a bit weird. Like Gen X couple without children, that's me. Renting apartments in terraces in high growth suburbs, that's me. Oh, no, it's not. I've got a mortgage. The categories get close to you, but they're never quite you. Your data double is never quite a double. So again, this is kind of has, I think, implications in terms of the ethics of the inclusions and exclusions of how these things are used. So am I going to conclude there? Yes. Um, again, so I was kind of saying already, like I've written a lot about symbolic violence. It's my favorite probably sociological concept. And I think what's going on with these things in terms of exclusion probably is, can still be conceived of as symbolic violence. But I've written about how symbolic violence needs to be considered through the notion of effect, you know, like a if you walk into a museum and you don't understand, you feel weird and you don't, you kind of exclude yourself in that Borgesian self. If you don't know the forks and or you wear the, wrong, wear the wrong clothes or the teacher tells you you're no good. These are kind of events that happen in relation, in day-to-day -day life where there's an effect, you feel something. I suppose if you miss out on something because of these categorizing machines, you feel something, but you don't really have that same relation. There's something different going on here. If taste classifies in the class, classifies the classifier in that classic Borgesian sense, I'm not sure the classifier is being classified here, if you know what I mean. It's a kind of, it's a cyborg or something. I, I don't know. I'm still, I'm not sure how to think through this as in kind of thinking out loud here. 
What's also interesting about this too is all that data is increasingly being combined with our genetic stuff. Um, people seem to be very keen to voluntarily spit into something and send it away to get your gene history. Um, and there's huge data banks being gathered on this kind of stuff. And, and you know, I don't want to sound like an episode of Black Mirror here, but it's like, um, it's concerning in terms of the data that um, these companies and have on us now. Particularly, apparently dancing is genetic. You, whether you experience dancing is pleasurable or not, these companies claim they can predict that. This is actually a colleague of mine, I'm not gonna tell you who it is. Um, and these are the predictive ones. They were all true, um, she said. There's one, about, there's one about whether you'll like coriander or not. Um, apparently that one was wrong for her, but like, um, so again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the implications of this are in the future ethically. Um, but I know that from a sociological point of view, I think we have to start thinking about new concepts, I think, to um, consider the way this kind of information is crossing lines in ways that maybe hasn't happened as much before. But I don't, don't know what the answers to that are. Maybe that's um, something we'll, we'll be working on in the future. Um, it's particularly the case because, to get back to where I began, is that the categories themselves are used in ways that I find particularly insulting. So as, as Skeggs and Yule's papers point out and, we, um, and others have shown, the categories that they produce, um, poor older women are called low hanging fruit and they are then sent dodgy credit stuff um, in, in, on their feeds to apply to kind of be able to kind of get more money, right? So. When I when I said at the start there where there's some kind of tech bro asshole <laughs> inventing something for any social problem that's happening, you know, this is another good example of it. Our data feeds into these machines. Someone out there is trying to exploit us uh, through it in ways that I think are very hard for us to kind of interpret, you know, when we're flicking through our um, social media feeds. Um, I have been trying to come with a, a more uh, optimistic ending to this talk, but like um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Good morning. Fantastic timing. <laughs> so we can open the floor now to your questions. Maybe um, somebody like to ask your first question. Uh, thanks so much. Um, um, so I, I work in, I don't work in this group, I work in uh, design informatics, uh, so we work with design and human interaction, but always been so inspired by kind of sociological work like this. Um, we are right at this moment doing a project with, at the moment, seven to 12 year olds about the kind of just with understanding children's interactions with digital forms of money. So just trying to understand what the day to day's interaction with money look like. Is it still pounds and pence pocket money? I and mean, then kind of a lot of the same things about what they're doing and seeing in games and things. And, and so yeah. it's very much a kind of early stage. And a lot of that is also about uh, moving beyond the idea of literacy. Like lots of things, lots of research that's been done with children and money is about how you educate them about money, not what they experience things. But um, right. so we could have a long time. <laughs> yeah. I did basically, I think I kind of want to understand a couple of things for you and, and you, like what were the youngest people that you worked with? And I guess, yeah, of the things that you've touched on or studied, you know, what would be the things you, if you had that group in front of you, what what, what should we be looking at when we're thinking about oh, right. 12 years okay. now? Mm, really good question. I mean, uh, I say we, we, we normally do 18 to 30. Um, youth are kind of the official age is like 15 to 25 in terms of governmental things, a youth allowance or whatever. But we use it more conceptually as a kind of transitional period between child and adult, mm -hmm. our own field has shown that the adult thing's happening later and later. So it's like we've kind of almost kind of destroyed our own object. But like, <laughs> um, so, but we normally do 18 to 13. We don't normally do under 18, th th under 18 simply for very pragmatic reasons as we have to get um, permission from their parents. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's a massive rigmarole. So we can just kind of keep it to 18 to 30. So there's that. In terms of, look, I mean, definitely the, I think the way that games themselves have all these kind of rewards in them that seem, what's the actual term? I can't quite think of it at the moment, but like there's like reward boxes and stuff and like they, they explode and kind of money comes out and all this kind of stuff. There's there's definitely kind of some kind of, I would say, gaslighting going on in that kind of thing that 
encourages young people to monetize or kids to monetize the way they think about this kind of stuff. And um, it, so in Australia at the moment, there's some real debates about like how young children should be allowed to kind of play these games and not, I'm, I'm not, a, I don't know about them. I'm not an expert in them by any respect, but there's definitely aspects of games that young people are playing that there seems to be real concerns with the way that they kind of expose them to kind of gambling in particular or, you know, um, gambling attitudes uh, in ways that um, seem to be, yeah, a real problem in terms of what you're talking about there. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, I'm a youth studies person. We don't do research with children, but we're increasingly like working with people that do and we're trying to build a big kind of centre of excellence thing at the moment that's, um, that's going to go from eight through to 25. Um, so we're hoping we, we'll be able to do that in the future. Do you know when, I was also wondering, like, so we're working with, like, quite young kids who are mostly, like, still maybe just have their own card and they're still getting pocket money. They certainly don't have jobs, but they might have some other ways of getting money. But when do you think people might start, probably their the first experience of debt, so, like, a 14-year-old's in debt? Or like, you know, where, where, where do you think that starts, perhaps? Um, yeah, I think getting into high school, um, people are starting to use buy now, pay later. Um, there's no proof. Like, like you could be eight years old and sign up for one. Um, if you know how to type and find the sites, there's no, you don't have to put your driver's license in or anything. Right? Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely high school. I mean, um, definitely in Newcastle, kids are starting to kind of get car loans and stuff at 15 and that kind of thing and getting their parents to go guarantor more, more often than not. I would say if you're interested in that, there's a centre of excellence in Australia called the Digital Child. Um, and they've done research that's similar to what you're saying there, and it's between zero and eight. Um, it's been going now for about five years, and they've got some amazing publications around that kind of stuff. So it's, it's based out of um, a university in Queensland. Yeah. Hugo, please. Thanks, Steve. Really enjoyed that. Lots of Lots of stuff to think around. Um, I was recently doing a little bit of stuff around model economy. Model. The model economy. So I just wanted to pick up that aspect of your work. Yeah. And whose terms are we talking about here in, in terms of good debt and bad debt? Because presumably <clears throat> different groups view these things differently. Yeah. But also, so um, an anthropologist who I, I've worked with, Filippo Asella, no, so the concept refers to two aspects, the, the economy aspect and the economy, uh, the, the, the moral aspect. In terms of the economy, then are these youngsters feeling like they're sort of gaming the system or tackling entrenched inequalities by gambling on stuff? Yeah. And then in terms of the moral aspects of it, I wonder if that comes out more when they're together, they're more conservative in their bets and in how they treated Zoe. And collectively, they have different views to how they view things when they're on their own. Yeah. So the first question, um, so the, in terms of who's who defined good and bad, we just asked them what they thought were good and bad debts, and then they named them, and then we've kind of coded what they said into those debts. So for the, yeah, so, and it was almost universal across all the interviews we've done. So we didn't we didn't talk to the young people about what we thought was good and bad. We asked them what they thought was good and bad, and then they told us. So, um, and then the moral economy of good to bad is kind of us then setting that up as a hierarchy, I suppose, in response to that. So the the, the moral the moral hierarchy there was kind of came out of the data itself. Um, we didn't kind of map that onto another model or someone else's work. Um, I suppose we're using the notions of good and bad there as moral. Um, so there's that. The the economy part of it's really interesting in the sense that the, the economy bit is about them investing in the future in terms of the way that we're using it. So I know I'm repeating myself here a little bit, but um, there's, there's not an exchange in an economy a sense with, they don't see the exchange itself with the institution of the bank or the buy now, pay later thing. I think the exchange is with the idea of themselves in five to 10 to 15 years time. 
Um, I think that's the way they are imagining this economic future. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of what we're we're using in that terms of moral economy in terms of the, the structured nature of the way that they're engaging with these products in ways to map out a trajectory to get somewhere. Um, but they're often not sure what that is. They have a kind of vague idea of it. Um, and how could they have a, have a, no really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure I answered your question directly there, but. Um, no, I, I mean, I guess insofar as there is a mobile economy, I imagine there'd be more of a collective aspect to it. And, and that element yeah. was slightly unclear there. So yeah. I was trying to get my head around where where is that? Yeah, the collective part, the, the two examples you um, use there, I think they're fascinating. I mean, they, they, there's something about a group of young people together that like like they invent things and kind of it gets more dramatic and all that kind of stuff. And that was definitely happening in the um, in the body mapping things. Um, but that in and of itself, I think, is really really interesting. Um, I suppose the difference in those things of one where it kind of is a very much denigrating young people, the other there's kind of this sense of care is in the difference between the the men know each other and their friends. So it's a reality where the other one, I suppose, from a kind of, you know, methodological point of view, it's a story or a narrative that they're making up. So they've probably got more freedom to kind of be mean to the imaginative person and their silly mate that's kind of lost 200 bucks last week or something where they actually care about that person, I suppose. So maybe that's got something to do with the, the difference in the way that they collectively orient towards the problem. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Steve. That was um, really interesting. Uh, lots of things I wanted to ask, but I was really interested that you've suddenly you're doing lots about emotions. So <laughs> predictable that I would be interested yeah. in that. But um, interested that you were sort of focusing quite a lot on ugly feelings. But presumably, there's a lot of, um, I mean, I don't like the negative positive feeling distinction, but the, a lot of the reasons for them engaging in these things that they're wary about is because there's some kind of fun or enjoyment because they are kind of games and they yeah. they sort of feel rewarded. But what do you think that kind of does to their... Um, their enjoyment of, of life and their, their, their kind of emotional lives? I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, mm. um, I mean, I would say the difference between mine and, and your orientation towards this stuff is I'm more likely to write a book called Sociology for Pessimists, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll just put that out there. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but look, so the thing I say about this is like, I'm glad they didn't exist when I was younger because I would have been using them heaps to buy Air Jordans and stuff, right? No, because consumption is fun and it feels good. So, what's what's so the interesting, the negative orientation towards instant gratificationary kind of purchases for me is that they didn't often talk about the fact that they wanted it and felt good. Mm. Um, um, and that was also in the interviews that others conducted, not just maybe me that like maybe influenced in that sense. So, um, I suppose, I suppose, again, it would be about the project itself. That's where, when we're asking them about debt, I think it puts them in a position where they're guilty. If we maybe refigured the interview process and asked them, started asking about consumption and all that kind of stuff, I think we would get more positive mm, kind of, you know, yeah, and con conviviality and joy and kind of, kind of that stuff mm, like that. Mm. A lot, uh, interesting, a lot, of, a lot of the examples I tended to you, wanted you to tell us about, well, it was interesting, many of them said they didn't use this stuff, but then after a while, you could tell that they were. <laughs> the other thing we want to do, the other thing that's really important is, is and everyone seems to lie about their finances and money. I, I don't know, like, not just young people. Um, we had one guy that was like, I'm really frugal and all that kind of stuff, and he had like a $500 pair of sneakers on, right? So... One of the methods we want to do is like a scroll back method um, in their afterpay and get them to talk through their purchases. Um, at least then we'll know the accuracy a little bit more about what they're telling us, but also then we'll, we'll get more aspects of that kind of stuff. They would kind of pitch the use of buy now, pay later, often for necessity. Um, I really needed a good dress to go to the law ball. You know, um, they didn't really talk too much about, you know, going out for a night on the town or stuff like that, that kind of stuff through these things. 
they tended to talk about strategic purchases. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that could be coloured through the, the tone and of the project itself, I think. But yeah, I, yeah just to kind of follow up, I mean, from a sort of slightly less obviously optimistic point of view, <laughs> do they feel like they're not allowed to have fun? You know that that's kind of irresponsible. Do you think? That yes, I think I think that? I think that that's that's actually a really interesting point. I mean, yeah. um, certainly in front of other adults and authority figures, which I no doubt they maybe kind of view us interviewing them as sometimes. Um, but I suppose they're not they're not they're not kids either. Like we're no. talking often twenty five year olds that like have they're a little bit more worldly. Um, but often I think in terms of the way this young people need to present themselves more and more. There's a presentation of self that is very much about employability and um, presenting themselves in a way that like maximizes their chances and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure they're talking about these things very differently amongst their peers. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, a really good question. I mean, it's a question that like you need to think about in terms of um, uh, accessing the wider emotional and even pragmatic um things that they're using these things for mm. because as i said too that like we know that they're often using them in really um responsible strategic ways to get by yeah. the, the one i didn't talk about uh, this thing called bundle um where they want you to buy everything through it including paying your rent and um, your shopping and they um but yeah then they're therefore going into debt every time you do it um and they advertise it as a responsible way of keeping track of everything um if you if you're unorganized, you know, you can do everything through this app and you can just see it all there. And they use this kind of very cutesy aesthetic. There's the bundle bear, and you can pause P-A-W-S your payments if you want. Um, so they're, they're kind of bringing in this kind of youthful, cute aesthetics in this kind of stuff as well to to, to draw that kind of consumption into it. Um, but our Respondents hated that. They were so wary of it, and they were like, they were they were swearing at us like, that. I'm never using that. That's that's in, that's an insult. Yeah. So there's a very much a critical orientation towards. They're the not world. cultural types at all. No, no, they're not. They're really not. Yeah, I really probably need to emphasize that more because um, they they're often using these things very well. Yeah. Interesting. We have very few horror stories out of the hundreds of interviews we've done. Yeah. Our next question is from John Hearn, and I am going to go switch on the lights while you ask. It's uh, fascinating stuff. I, um, you started to answer my question, or one of my two questions there, which was like, where's where's the punishment? Where's the downside if you get too much into debt? Because it's it doesn't. I, I don't hear a story of. Lots of young people being put in debtor's prison or you know whatever. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, so it sounds uh, more like, um, well, this is just the new normal. I mean, because modern the modern economy uh, doesn't pay people enough to drive the consumer economy. Uh, yes, this lubrication to make it happen. Yes, and all these companies are skimming stuff off. Right, That's right. Yeah. And so if some people get into big trouble. It doesn't matter if the most of the people, most of the consumers are trickling their money. Yes. Right? So if that's the model, I guess there's always this question with these generational perspectives, which is, are you looking at um, uh, some <laughs> shift in values, aesthetics, mm. you, know, you know, or is this just the new normal? And it's from this point on, they'll they'll mature and they'll keep consuming in this fashion because that's the only option on the table for a lot of people. Yep. And this is just the new normal. Or is there some sort of I think it's both. change? I think it's both. Um, so, yeah, um, there's there's both of those things going on at once. I mean, sorry, what was the, thing, the first thing you said? The, the first thing was, is does anybody ever get it? Okay, yeah, definitely. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That was, that. so yes. So buy now, pay later products in particular, um, in terms of your credit rating, you can use them really well for years and it'll never do anything positive for your credit rating. But if you mess up on them, your credit rating will go down. Mm -hmm. So it has it definitely has implications on moving. If we want to say something, a way of kind of getting into more mature forms of debt, mm -hmm. it'll be harder to get a car loan, a house loan and all that kind of stuff if you have a poor credit rating using these things. So there's definitely um, 
some consequences there. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is the new normal. I think like any technology, I mean, like there was moral panics over the Sony Walkman, right? And all this kind of stuff, you know, that so new generations use them in a normal way that often us older people find wrong and that, and that is new, new in that sense. But I think what this has done in a way that hasn't happened before has opened up lines of credit in a way that are much easier now than ever. I mean, even credit cards for a while there, you had to kind of fill out a form and get one. Then they changed it to sending them to you, right? But at least, you know, you had to then open the mail and get them and your parents were probably around. These things you can just use. There's no, there's no real barriers, I think, other than your own guilt or shame or, um, you know, willingness to get in trouble off your parents or whatever. You might say credit's being mass produced. Yeah, yeah. And it, well, it's been being increasingly mass produced for decades, right? And this is, I think, definitely the next step. So I think there is a subjective difference um, and, a, and a wider access to credit. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, but, you know, it definitely... You know, if we want to kind of be neutral about it, it, has different affordances and risks. And I think, you know, there are a lot of risks involved in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely also, I think, a different aesthetic and feeling rules around these kind of things as well. So one of the things I didn't talk about that's in the moral economy paper is um, that uh, young people like these things because it's more like their day-to-day -day lives. It was going on in our research then was going on in Australia when there was a, a, a royal commission into the banks and the corruption in the banks. So in the news every day was how terrible the banks were, um, and young people in particular was, would talk about how intimidated they were by banks. Banks are institutions with men in suits where you have to go in and talk to someone. Um, I probably need my mum and dad to come with me, and you know if you mess up with them, they can blow up your life. Is a, a thing one of a, someone said to us. They don't feel that's the same thing going on in this kind of more digitized space. So the aesthetic effect kind of stuff, I think, um, in relation to the open accesses, I think is something different. But I don't think it's like, you know, I think it's just a progression of what's been happening. Who knows what the next one will be? Mm. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I, I'm just going to borrow from you. No, no, if it follows on from that, on you go. I'll catch up later. It was, it was, just, it was just the... the this idea of being normal, but the thing you said about like is money not seeming real, and I just wondered if, well, again, from the kids' perspective, we're really interested in what they think real money is, from toy money to coins to digital to gaming money, whatever. And I just wondered if the the the, the easiness of which you can access credit changes the, the perception of real money and the kind of responsibilities and things. And that, oh, I think it does. Yeah, I think I really think it does. And I mean, and we and banks. FinTech all want us to move to a cashless society, right? Because they, again, they can take a snip out of every transaction. Now, if I buy something with you for 20 bucks, you get the 20 bucks. If I do it to over PayPal, it costs me, what, $20.05, and they, you know? So um, it definitely changes the um, feeling of money, definitely changes the orientation towards it, feel, uh, it definitely makes it feel more like a game. Um, I think without doubt that's happening in, the, in these apps. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of literature on this kind of stuff, mm. on, the, on the kind of um, change ever since, you know, Ritz are writing about the, the credit card. Like it's a very much a development of that. It's, um, particularly good stuff in the Journal of Cultural Economy that I think quite, a few, quite a few people here at um, this university are involved in. Yeah. And then you're up. Uh, yes. <laughs> No, thank you for that. It's really great stuff. Um, I thinking back to your earlier work and your comment about the the person with the five hundred dollar <laughs> trainers that says he's frugal. I just wondered, is there any discourse around about climate change and you know circular economy? Too much stuff. Critique of consumption. Is there any anything of that anywhere? No, not so much in these projects. I mean, our, our creative industries people that were um, doing side hustles would talk about reselling and that kind of stuff in that realm. In other, in other work I've done, definitely. Um, certainly my work in the punk scenes, they were very concerned about their consumption practices and, and that kind of thing. Um, that hasn't really been the object of this study, to be, to be straightforward about it, to be honest. So, no. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Back to Hugo. Follow up to, to Lynn's. Have any of your research team done more comparative work? I mean, do, do these practices vary from place to place? No, we haven't. Um, and that's definitely much a model of the funding that we have access to. Um, yeah, so we've got an application for a massive thing at the moment. You'll see all that kind of dozen uh, uh, things I had there is essentially small pots of money that we can kind of do relatively pilot study level stuff around to build it into a larger kind of coherent project over a few years. Um, so no, we haven't done a lot of comparison. I, I doubt there's much difference in terms of um, the use of these things between say places like the UK um, in Australia and maybe the US. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Um, I know, for instance, just, just being at Glasgow, that they are advertised and used differently um, in different continents. So gambling apps in particular are currently being um, like advertised towards young people in various African countries as a way to make a living, um, which is, again, like, on the kind of rather dystopian side of it. Uh, Christopher Bunn's work at the University of Glasgow, and if everyone's familiar with him, is doing some amazing work on that, um, if you're interested in that. Um, but I would say, and it'd be as much, the differences, and I'm kind of speculating a little bit here, would be more on the production of them and what they're used for and who they're being targeted at, to begin with at least, in as opposed to maybe the different ways that people use and consume them and, and strategize with them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, while they're thinking, I'm wondering how much, um, how much parents know about this? And also how much um, the kind of example of parents came through in the discussions. Like, was it, I am not going to become my father who was always losing money on gambling. Like, how much is there a kind of generational comparison or generational influence coming through in your data? Yeah, I think the simple answer there is heaps. <laughs> heaps. Uh, it seems that the example of the way parents use money very much filters down to the way that the kids do. Mostly not in the way that I'm not going to be like my parents, more like I am, even if they're chaotic and bad with money. Um, the couple of examples that we have of people getting into real trouble spoke about how their parents were terrible with money. They're always in debt. They're always chasing money. And that's I thought that was normal. The real horror story we have, for instance, is a girl that's now like 26 with three kids and since $75,000 worth of debt across like three by now pay the later apps, a couple of credit cards um, who, you know, got sent a credit card when she was 15, spilled it all out. Parents didn't know she had it. She maxed that one out. She maxed another one out chasing that. She maxed another one out. She got married. She opened up a buy now pay later in her name, then her husband's name, then her maiden name. Um, you know, <laughs> looks is still relatively young. So she stopped doing that about five years ago, but like, you know, went absolute shitload of debt. Ashamed of it, guilty, feels like an idiot, starting to kind of, you know, rationalize it. She's the one that kind of says my future is on a whole. Um but talked about how like that just growing up, her parents were just constantly in debt. Uh, people coming around chasing money, they, she just thought it was normal. That's the way you kind of stitch things together. Um so while I wouldn't say we have data where I could start talking about something like, say, a financialized habitus or whatever, that, that maybe I would have wanted to do a few years ago, um, I think that's very much the case. Yeah. We don't have anyone talking about how I don't want to be like my parents. No. Yeah. You did a genetic test. We have a relatively test. middle class. Oh, yeah, we've got the genetic test to know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have a, I'd say a real weakness in our data is that um, we have a relatively middle class um, cohort, I think, um, Recruitment in Newcastle is quite difficult outside of those um, things. We've actually employed, as I said, um, recruitment companies that actually we were going to pay them five grand to like get them 20 men and they got us three. <laughs> so we ended up paying them like 600 bucks <laughs> for three men. <laughs> we're lucky it was pro rata. Um, but um, so, yeah, we um, not, not, not so, we don't have a lot of data on that, but my, my suspicions are 
it's more about like following examples rather than rebelling against. But um, I would also say that if you're interested in parent and um, children relation, financial relationships, my colleague Julia Cook's doing this incredible study, uh, DEPRA study in Australia on um, intergenerational wealth transfers between parents and kids to buy houses. Um, and she's working with a particularly privileged cohort. She's interviewing the parents and the kids. Um, her cohort's not all that. Some it's just parents, some it's just kids, but she's got a bunch of ones that parents are kids. And quite often the parents and kids have different ideas about what's going on with that money. But she has also great data about what rich people do with their money, you know, and very simple stuff like not only giving the deposit or loaning the deposit, but like then dumping a few hundred grand in an offset account so the kids don't have to worry about interest um, in ways that kind of, you know, very much replicate uh, the asset economy that has been increasingly theorised in Australia. So I really highly recommend that work. It's, it was amazing. You've inspired another question. <laughs> Um, as far as the topic of parents being involved, um, when you say that the privileged can invest, um, but the rest must gamble, how do parents play a role or, or do they play a role in that? Yeah, I'm not sure they do. I mean, I'm talking more about what the young people are, talk, are telling us um, in the interviews. I, I, and I suppose I'm um, very much kind of theorizing out of that, not so much about what they're telling us directly, but I'm kind of, I suppose, thinking about the implications of what they're saying rather than of what they're saying rather than what they actually say. You know, you know what I mean there? Like, um, yeah, it's more like the vibe of what they're saying rather than the direct quotes of what they're saying. You know what I mean? It's coming out in the, in the increased suspicion that they're having and very, very obvious throughout the kind of four or five years have been doing this, asking the same questions about the future and debt with a kind of slightly changed orientation towards those things. So, it's more my interpretation of what they're saying than the, what they're saying inside them, themselves, I think. Yeah. I think that's such a no based on what you just said about um, the middle classness, perhaps, of the cohorts involved in the research. But did anyone mention earned wage access and those sorts of, it's quite a new like fintech thing that I went to a talk someone else was giving about. So, what was it called, sorry? Earned wage access. It's when these companies will like, employers will subscribe to them. And allow employees who are on zero hours contracts who work like hourly to take money like that they have earned that month so far before payday for a small cut of the money. No, that's the new one that I have not heard of. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll have to write that down before you go so yeah. I can look into that one. Yeah, I mean, what a elegant way to take money out of people's pockets. Yeah, you know, it's horrifying. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I'm definitely increasingly like hate, hate these people as I've been doing this this project. Yeah, I was called it earned earned wage access. Earned wage so, access. so you can access it's like the getting a loan on your own wage. Yeah, yeah. I hate that. <laughs> thanks, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I was interested in what you said about how this feels for people, and when you mentioned doom scrolling. That you mentioned this new emotion that was that was coined, and I was wondering about this sort of theme of the guilt, or that people know it's bad for them, but they're kind of doing it anyway. Is is it similar in some people's minds to kind of other maybe problematic behaviours, drinking, addictive type? Does that come probably, up? probably. I think. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit sus on the way that sometimes you know being online is proposed to be addictive um, I don't know like that. maybe that's like a disciplinary thing between sociologists and psychologists or something like that. or even more my kind of reaction that is constantly like against moral panic orientation towards young people that kind of seen as cultural chips but like, I'm not saying it's not problematic sometimes but like yeah, I'm not sure about addiction but I think definitely um, there's there's correlations between those things for sure but again I would also go back and say what else can they do? If you've in a cost of living crisis in a job that promises you 30 hours a week, but you only ever get 10 and, you know, rent in Australia has gone up like, you know, places that were $400 a week three years ago and now $600 a week. And um, what else are they going to do to get by? Um, again, I, I just think it's a completely reasonable thing to be playing around these things, with these things to be able to have a life. Um, otherwise, what are they going to do to have a life? 
Um, certainly the labour market isn't looking after them. Governments aren't. They're taking on the only options that are in front of them. So while I'm obviously critical and wary of the whole, all the things, I'm, I think that um, that's what I'd be doing. I like it. Yeah. I mean, I was an apprentice for four years where we had $200 a week. Like, yeah, I would have got in crazy trouble with these things, wanting more and more stuff now as I did back then. So, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm worried sometimes that I feel that I'm replicating a moral panic thing about being concerned about the, the implications of this stuff. But it's more so that the I think the predatory behaviour of the companies need to be regulated and our coward governments won't do it. They'll much rather ban social media for young people, which they're trying to do in Australia at the moment. Under 16s are trying to ban them off social media. It's just crazy talk. Um, but they won't take on Meta and they won't take on companies because they're scared of them. Um, despite none of them paying tax in our countries or anything like this, they're just kind of scared of actually taking on the big problems. So let's just ban young people from stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's just they're all acting quite reasonably, if not sometimes risky. And good on <laughs> yeah. I think I was thinking of it more from kind of what Lynn was saying about the consumption thing because yeah. I have a couple of family members who are very good at accumulating debt by buying things that they don't really need yep. and the way that people will talk about necessity oh, I need this dress for this event yeah. versus like alternatives like second hand or yeah. use or whatever yes. yeah. they're not kind of yeah. more desperate would be a fascinating project to create, you know, maybe different forms of consumption and then how, a way people consume and how they relate to people make less decisions for sure. Yeah. yeah. There'd be definitely something between alternative and mainstream. I don't really like that distinction either, but like the way people orient themselves around and whether they go into debt to buy something or not, which is probably not in some circles, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's time for one last question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. It's been great. Romantic partners. <laughs> we talked about parents. What about the influence of romantic partners? Is is it um do you become less attractive as a potential date if you're known to to be in debt? Or or is it so normalized that it doesn't matter? Because everybody's in debt and it's about to, you're really bonding once you know about each other's debt. I'd be or very share a debt. I'd be very surprised if two young people on their first Tinder date are talking about whether they have afterpay or not. So I'd say there's a bit of you know, there's the shame of guilt of debt definitely applies across here. The way the partners came up in the um in the research, there's a few ways a few ways. Certainly um in the gambling stuff, the young men talked about how they only gamble with their mates if they go to the pub with their partner, they don't gamble. Um, so there's obviously a lot of, you know, masculinity stuff going on in the um, in the kind of need to gamble in those situations. Um, we had, uh, One guy that lost a lot of money, you know, basically decided that he wouldn't gamble anymore when he lost so much money that he couldn't buy his partner a present for a birthday the next week and very nearly lost the relationship. And that was a kind of very much a key moment for him. Um, it, it's interesting that project because I know all the people. Um, and in their interviews, they were often a little bit shifty with the truth because I actually know some of the truth, but he wasn't. He actually said stuff that I didn't know about in that thing. Um, and yeah, so the more partners were kind of, not really, most of them are quite young and don't have like full on serious like, marriages or relationships. Um, there were some in the first project where we interviewed about 70 odd people. But the, the more, the, the recent um, stuff we've been doing has been with a younger cohort, particularly with university students that haven't quite settled down, on, I think, in that, or in those positions where they have to worry too much about other people than themselves in terms of their own financial position. Yeah. Yeah. But again, and I think that, again, there's a lot of literature on that and there's a lot of literature on the kind of the way that financial debt um, puts huge um, pressure on relationships, let alone the stuff around financial abuse and the way that kind of men control women through their bank accounts and through controlling that sort of kind of stuff. And increasingly, there's a bunch of interesting research in Australia around uh, financial abuse and elders mm -hmm. um, wanting to access the inheritance now so they can buy a house and all kinds of stuff that happens 
around those kind of things. That's um, again, not very nice. And like a Julia Cook and Peter Cook are doing some interesting work around that kind of stuff in Australia. Well, then, um, if if those are all the questions, then. I would just, before uh, we say goodbye, wanted to mention that the next um, speaker in the series is Rebecca Hewer, our very own Rebecca Hewer. If you would like to take um, uh, a schedule with you uh, to, to know the, the schedule for the entire semester, then uh, please feel free to pick one up. Um, but um, I wanted to end by thanking our wonderful speaker for such a stimulating talk. We will now watch out for these apps and we will not fall into those traps <laughs> thanks to you. And I'm sure that it's going to produce a lot of extra important things that you can this talk. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's all about like having the best thing. Yeah.